Now on BBC One, a new series of Antiques Roadshow. Welcome to another series of the Antiques Roadshow, our 24th, if you're counting. As usual, we shall chart a zigzag route across the country, from Cornwall to Scotland to Wales and beyond. This time, we shall cross the North Sea and the Atlantic, from Shetland to Canada. We shall go racing at Newmarket, and we shall see our share of stately homes. Where do we begin? Well, here, in the glorious countryside of the Peak District, and the town of Buxton, Derbyshire which claims to be one of the highest in England. There is a cavern in the town, and this is where the earliest inhabitants of Buxton enjoyed the basic comforts of life over 7,000 years ago. This is Poole's Cavern, famous not only for its stalactites, those are the ones that hang down, but for its usefulness as a hideaway for outlaws. In the 15th century, one of the most notorious, a man called Poole, kidnapped a wealthy widow and fled here to hide. He would occasionally pop out to rob passers-by, and the story goes that his loot is still buried here. A natural treasure found only in nearby caves is the mineral known as Blue John Stone, for over 200 years in great demand for ornamental vases and jewellery. The very dark Ashford marble also comes from here, but it's Buxton Springs that have been its main attraction. Emerging at a constant 28 degrees centigrade, the water saved the medieval population the chore of preparing a hot bath, to say nothing of its healing qualities. And locals today will tell you that the water they draw from the well makes the best cup of tea in Britain. Well, I'm not going to argue with that. And if Mary, Queen of Scots, said that the water helped her rheumatism, that's okay with me as well. It was the Duke of Devonshire who, in 1780, decided to transform Buxton into the spa town of the north and a fitting place to accommodate his chums. The Duke modelled his crescent on the classic lines of the Royal Crescent in Bath. It was one big hotel for aristocratic guests and took four years to complete. Then came the great stables and riding school, headquarters for coachmen, grooms, carriages and over a hundred horses, which were exercised in the enormous circular courtyard. The courtyard was covered by the largest unsupported dome in the world, bigger even than the domes of St. Paul's Cathedral and St. Peter's in Rome. This would have been the perfect place to stage our road show, except for one problem. Right in the middle of the courtyard, you get a strange effect called a flutter echo. This could be very disconcerting for our experts at a crucial moment, and our engineering manager really put his foot down. Wow. Instead, we're all set up in another of Buxton's fine buildings, the Octagon. Among the familiar faces on the team today are David Batty, Henry Sandon, and Lars Tharp on porcelain, and Hilary Kay, joined by a newcomer, Madeline Marsh, on a miscellaneous table. So, with myself on drums, let's get the show on the road. You've actually brought along a piece of eggshell porcelain that raises my spirit. Um, I think it's fair to say that it doesn't get much better than Rosenberg. How did this Dutch pot arrive in this part of the world? Well, I bought it at a, a local auction, uh, along with a piece of blue and white pottery. It was a, a, lot, a job lot of two items. What was it sold to you as? As a kettle or a it was, teapot? It was or a, a teapot, yes. As a teapot? Yes. We only found out later that we thought it was a chocolate pot. Well, it may well um, be based on a chocolate pot, mm. but um, I don't think they were ever really meant to be used. No, I wouldn't think so. I think so, this no, is no. purely ornamental. Mm. But let's get to grips with it. First of all, that lovely shape. Let's just turn it around. You've got that lovely loop handle. And it's almost organic, isn't it? Mm. Yes. It's almost as though it's growing and it's evolved rather than it's been potted. Mm. Um, and what about these fish? I mean, these fish are glorious. And because they're, they're entirely hand-painted. In, in fact, everything on here is hand-painted. And you've just got to look at the detail. And um, what else can we say? Well, we, let's, have a, let's just take the top off, shall we? 
very, very careful. The great thing about um, this particular factory, situated in The Hague, yes. um, there was a factory there in the, in the 18th century, and they used a stork uh, as a mark because storks used to nest in the, in the, the chimneys, chimneys yeah. of yeah. The Hague, so you'd expect that. Um, and um, the, the Rosenberg factory from the, the late 19th century also incorporated a stork. And various other marks, that, that, that particular starburst is actually a year symbol. Mm -hmm. I would suspect that this is around about 1900, maybe 1905. Mm. Mm. Yes. And then um, the decorator. Yes. Um, and the, the, the H is almost certainly for heart green. Now, it's difficult to be absolutely sure, but the actual shape itself um, was probably designed by um, the head of their design, a man called J. Jurian Koch. Has it had any restoration? It's a little bit of restoration. The handle was broken and we had it restored professionally. And there's a few little chips a few on little it that chips were, were actually restored. Right. Okay. Yeah. Well, you expect that because you know, this is so thin um, and so delicate that the, um, the failure rate in the kiln, I think for every um, 50 of these that went in the kiln, uh, probably only um, five came out because the, they collapsed yeah, yeah, because yeah. it is so, so fragile. Now, fill me in on the financial side. Well, along with the blue and white plate, we paid £100. All right, yes. OK. Yes. So and then you've had to have it restored. Red restoration, which was a few hundred pounds as well. Right, well, I mean, I know a collector um, in The Hague, um, and I, I'm pretty certain that if I was to say um, it's yours, um, if you're prepared to pay £1,500, he would snap my hand off for mm -hmm. it. And all I can say is, the day you went to that auction was a jolly good day's fishing. Mm, yes, Wouldn't yeah, you agree? Oh, I must say, yeah, yes. yeah, yeah. I've seen a lot of scrap screens in my time, but I have to say, this really is a cracking example. Um, now, is it something that you bought, or did it... We brought this in, in about, about 1968, 1969, and my mother's one of those people, when they go out of the house, my father starts to have heart attacks. Because she never, he never knows what she's got to bring back. <laughs> but, um, and even when my mother brought this back, my father just couldn't for the life of him understand why she brought, brought it. But for my mother, it was the love of the pictures. Well, let's just have a look at the, the screen itself, because I'm, I'm, I love the design of it. Um, a lot of these little chromo lithographic panels were known as scraps and they were sold as scraps and that's how you get a scrap book because that was a book to put your scraps into uh, and they were sold commercially in toy shops and uh, stationery shops and so on for exactly that, this purpose, for decorative purposes. I love these down here of the early bicycles of all sorts. You've got. Um, ordinary bicycles or penny farthings uh, as they're called more of the same all sorts of shenanigans going on on bicycles and then the uh, central figure here is framed by this lovely garland of scrap flowers in fact looking at it there's a little bit of damage sort of holes here was that as it, as it came to the family or that was later in its history there were times when I actually used to use this as a dartboard. Oh, no! <laughs> Just to occupy my free time. <laughs> That's terrible! Did they ever find out? I think they're going to find out today. <laughs> That's a terrible story. Yes, I can... I can were you, what were you aiming for? Were you aiming... Well, I was actually aiming to take the heads off. <laughs> but... <laughs> Ghastly. All right, well, we'll gloss over that one. Um, what strikes me particularly about this screen is how beautifully uh, designed it is. Everything balances, it's um, completely symmetrical, but then you've also got this central panel. This is, is very different to the other two. This is um, religious scenes, much sort of uh, more somber in tone. And looking at the screen, I've been trying to work out whether this is something that's been produced commercially or whether it was just really well done by a family at home because I have a feeling that this sort of decoupage would have been allowed on a Sunday because this is of a religious context so maybe they worked on putting the other panels there on other days of the week and this panel they only worked at on a Sunday so 
I think that it is really good amateur work rather than a professionally produced screen. Um, I wonder what your parents paid for it in the 60s. Well, I know my mother told me that she paid 30 shillings for it, or £1.50 in today's currency. Well, and one has to remember in the 60s, they were burning Victorian furniture. You know, they couldn't get it out of their houses quick enough. So 30 bob, not bad. Um, in today's money, I would have said something around 1,000 to 1,500 pounds. So a reasonable investment. No, that's very nice. Yeah. She'll be very happy. Have you seen this little signature down there? Yes, I couldn't, couldn't make it out terribly well. J.P. Whale, W-A-L-E, which is John Porter Whale. Now, John Porter Whale was um, a Worcester artist. He did some extremely fine painting down at Worcester in the 1860s and 70s. And then he came up to Derby to help found the new Derby Royal Crown Porcelain Company. Um, and uh, he was very instrumental in, in ensuring the success of Derby. And it's lovely seeing a Derby plaque here in Derbyshire. <laughs> well, I, I'd almost despaired of seeing some Derby, but uh, <laughs> here it is. And you've had this a long time? Yes, it belonged to my mother, and before that it belonged to her aunt. So, yes. yes, it's been in the family a while. And what price have they put on it? Um, two to three hundred, I was told. Three hundred? Mm-hmm. You've been told by what, what uh, a, a dealer? A local Values, yes. well, well, I think they're undervaluing it. All right, um, good. That sounds good. My my thoughts are certainly a thousand pounds plus. Really? Wow. He's a very fine artist. I think it's very very beautifully painted. It's very interesting because it's a complete fake yes. in every sense. Um, it is a Moorcroft design. It's a well-known design of about 1901, 1902, which is mm. registered. But what is wrong is the shape is never a Moorcroft shape. Um, the whole sort of feel of it is wrong, and that's because it's actually made of porcelain, yes. not earthenware, which Moorcroft used. There's no mark, which of course there would have to be, or there would be likely to be, even though unmarked Moorcroft does exist. It's a very, very, very good copy indeed, um, but it is designed to deceive, yes. because there is no such Moorcroft piece. No. Now, every week on the Roadshow, you hear our experts doing evaluation on various items. Now, when they talk about an auction price, they're referring to the price that item would fetch if it went to auction, but you'd have to, of course, subtract the commission of the auctioneer, which could be 10 or 15 percent. You'll also hear them mention insurance valuation, and that's always a higher price than the auction price because it's what happens if the item has to be replaced on the retail market, and that takes into account auctioneers' commissions and dealers' markups. It's, it's a sort of difference between a selling price and a buying price. It is all a bit confusing at first, and if you want to know more, you will find it on our website. And every time you see this address, you'll know you can check on our website, not only on matters to do with valuations, but anything that's been on the show over the past five years. It's certainly worth a look. What a fantastic collection of stuff. How on earth, you know, do you store all this at home? Well, we've actually got it all on display in the kitchen and, and around, around the cottage everywhere. In fact, you know, every square inch is taken up with boxes and everything. Yeah, it's all cottage. <laughs> and what do you think about it? It's all right. It's all right. Yeah. <laughs> Not quite sure. Well, I think it's really, really brilliant because it's a fantastic selection of packaging. Packaging really took off in the second half of the 19th century with new technology. Pioneers in the field, Huntley and Palmers, who, um, who really sort of yeah, started off the decorated biscuit tin, always well marked, Huntley and Palmers. Initially, you used to buy your biscuits from the local bakery, you know, in a, in a little paper bag. But of course, with improved transport in the 19th century, suddenly you get roads, you get trains. And so you need storage because you've got to store your biscuits so that when you're traveling around the country, they don't, they don't get broken up. And also, fantastic advertising. How much did you pay for it? I can't honestly remember. It was, it was probably about 20 pounds, 25 pounds-ish. Yeah. That's very good. Well, this is an early 20th century Huntley and Palmer's one. I mean, in a top condition, this, you know, tins like this can fetch three to five hundred pounds. There's a little bit of wear and tear on it, but it's not bad, so I think that was very good. And for you, is it value of these things that matters anyway? No, it's not the value at all. It's, it's, it's just sentimental. It. Well, no, not more sentimental. It's really just, you know, the, the visual aspect of yes. it, you know. It's, it's like, 
Our house is like walking to a museum, people have said, you know, you can look round and... Do people get very excited when they come in? Do they get, oh, I remember. A, a few people Windsor. do. Other people just think it's junk and rubbish, you know. Do they? But we don't. I mean, no. <laughs> we, we collect everything and anything, don't we? Yeah. we everything. Well, that's so nice, because with things like this, I bet sort of, you know, whether it's Rinso or Fab, you know, it, it's such provocative memories, because you never, you don't forget things like no, that. No. And if you look at the back, I mean, I love that. Yeah. There's that, that mum, you know, the sort of in her 50s style dress, yeah. so yeah. thrilled by the fact that her washing <laughs> is so clean. And it says here, um, for painters and mechanics overalls, butchers' aprons and pit clothes. And it's just that little yeah. bit of social history that really makes things come to life. Right. Again, something like that, if you bought that from a packaging dealer, five to ten pounds. And I know, you know, the idea of collecting loo paper. <laughs> Where do you have these? The bathroom. All over the bathroom. Yeah. But it's, it's lovely. You know, some of these things, you know, are worth a reasonable amount of money. Things like that, you know, no. a couple, couple yeah, of quid. <laughs> but, you know, how interesting to see. And I think it's a really exciting collection. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you Thank for you. bringing it in. And I want to come to your house now. Right. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> this is a very unusual North Italian sword, not the sort of thing that uh, you see very often over here. Where did you get it from? It was it, from my father-in-law. He, uh, he collected swords and uh, pistols in the uh, mid-60s. Um, he died early 70s and they've been in the family since then. But it's known as a Schiavona and it's a type that dates from the end of the 17th century right. and very distinctive with this very complicated basket guard which is really a function of armor falling into disuse because of firearms firearms would shoot their way through the toughest armor and people took the view that there was no point wearing it and so instead of having a gauntlet to protect your hand people put the protection that the gauntlet would have given you onto the sword instead it's also got this thumb loop so you can really get a grip of that and you can bear down with your thumb which pulls the whole sword tightly into your hand because this is a chopping sword it's a cutter rather than a, than a, a prodder or a thruster but very very nice sword and in very good condition and we then move a bit further north in Europe from northern Italy to this magnificent specimen from the first decades of the 17th century and it's a type that was very popular during the 30 years war and it's a war that produced lots and lots of very famous names including a man called Pappenheim who was an imperialist general on the Catholic side and for some reason swords with this complicated basket style of guard are called Pappenheimers okay. I don't think he invented it I think he was far too busy slaughtering Protestants to worry about uh, right designing sword hilts but again it's another very effective type of sword which gives tremendous protection to the whole of the hand and again it's in very very fine condition they are both very desirable swords because they are 17th century good condition and if you had to go and buy the Pappenheim sword you would pay something like about three thousand pounds for it the Shivona a little less at about two thousand so there's the best part of £5,000 worth of swords there. That's more than I expected. Much more than I expected. The man said, Paul, give me a pound. Paul, give me 75 pence. Paul, give me uh, 50 pence. 50 I'm having to think, you know. Two and sixpence. And I said, yes, it's got to be worth that. Two and sixpence? Two and sixpence. And how many years ago was that? I believe it was about... 1968. My word. Well, that is not bad. And you know what it is? Yes, I know that it's an arts and crafts chair and that it was perhaps made by a William Birch in High Wycombe in 1904. Well, yes, you're quite right. Um, it is a, a William Birch chair. Uh, William Birch were one of the larger manufacturers in High Wycombe. And they were also one of the more adventurous manufacturers. Now, this particular model was actually commissioned by Liberties and made by William Birch. So you have two great names, Liberties and William Birch, and you also have the name of the design, a man called Punnett. And they come together in this, this typical arts and craft piece. W what is it that appeals to you about this kind of thing? A lot of people hate it. I, uh, I just like its 
bulk and heaviness. I think it's lovely. I think it's something that will last forever. Uh, it is a design classic. You can go to the Victorian Album Museum and mm -hmm. see one I of these. I have seen it. I have seen a companion there. Yeah. yeah. Well, then you, you know what I, I'm talking yeah. about. But uh, equally, it was mass-produced. So there are quite a lot of them about. Mm. Um, so for that reason, it's not going to be hugely valuable, and one can still buy a chair like this for, I suppose, getting on for six to eight hundred pounds at auction. Oh gosh, Alec, that's wonderful. Do you know who General Jacob was? I do now. I didn't up to two weeks ago until right. I found uh, a biography on him. He was one of those sort of very remarkable Victorians who went out into the empire and literally grabbed it by the scruff of the neck and shook it into Britishness almost, if I can put it like that. He not only was a soldier, he was also a very competent administrator. He was political agent and superintendent for the Upper Sindh area of India. And he was a man who liked irregular scrapping with guerrillas, strike here, do your own thing. Yeah. Would he have paid for the guns himself for the, the army? Or... I think he would have been either presented with them or he would have gone and bought them. Officers right. bought their own equipment. Um, the army issued soldiers with its clothing and um, their equipment and their arms, yeah. but the officers were expected to go and buy their equipment from gentlemen's outfitters. So you'd go to your tailor and say, right, I want a red coat, and uh, yeah. it's that, you go to a gunmaker. And the gunmaker who made these magnificent pair of pistols was one of the two greats of the period, both brothers, John and Joseph Manton. And these are actually made by John Manton and company. And I think we can date these fairly accurately because of the inscription on the lid. They're going to be somewhere around about 1840. Right. And they're what's known as belt pistols because they have that spring clip around the side, which conveniently would slip onto your belt. And the, these great big heavy pistols were favoured by officers in India because two or guaranteed shots with very heavy bullets that were more than enough to deal with any enemy who might have been charging at you and they were greatly favoured. They're also favoured by people who hunted tigers from the backs of elephants and they often carried a pair of these in the howdah so that if you got the old tiger running up the back of the elephant to have a go at the people in the howdah you could deal with it by one of those. But they're, they're really pistols effective. of exceptional quality and these are highly desirable for the fact that they are made by the era's greatest gunmaker. They've also got this wonderful provenance from this great Victorian man who is uh, you know, a real character, larger than life. And on that basis, I think they're worth around about £10,000. And they're quite the best pair of pistols that I've ever seen on the road show. Oddly enough, this was made in the same place as that. Oh, right. It's from Kutani in K Kaga province in Japan, about 1880. Mm. What's so nice about it is the subject matter. Yes, lovely. You've got this wonderful, fat... Mm. I'm not even sure he's an owl. I think he's an owlet. He's a baby yes, owl, isn't he? Yes, I think so, it? too. Um, and what's nice, though, is the way he's sitting there, sort of looking at his lunch. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> he's about to yeah. put this claw yeah. down and go, yes. oh, breakfast, lunch, lovely. Mm. Do you, you liked it, too, did you? Yeah, I think it's absolutely lovely. Yeah. It's particularly the shape. You want to touch you it want all to the touch time. You want to touch it, yes. yes. And, of course... The colour around the back is quite breathtaking. Yes. And this particular mm. green colour, very characteristic of Kutani, mm. as is this mixture of black on green. Mm. Again, something mm. uh, you would expect mm. to come from there. Mm. Well, I think it's a marvellous thing. Mm. Where did this one come from? Um, well, that was left to my mother. Um, she visited the, the house of an elderly couple who did collect antiques. Um, and admired it. In fact, as she went past it, she stroked it and uh, didn't meet them again for many years. But when they, the, uh, the wife died, she left it to my mother in her will. Oh, wonderful. Because she'd admired it. Oh, so. isn't that nice? Mm. I think um, that would fetch somewhere between uh, 1800 and two and a half thousand pounds. Wow. Well, we must continue to keep it on a high shelf. <laughs> my husband bought it in an antique shop in Stockport. It wasn't actually in the shop itself. He went there to buy another picture, which had gone. And the gentleman there said, I've got a portrait at home. And he took us there to see it. My husband fell in love with it. Well, I'm not surprised. I mean, I, I've completely fallen in love with her in the short time that I've been able to look at it. Uh, and I think you're aware that it's by John Graham Gilbert. Yes. 
yes. Scottish artist, mm -hmm. and uh, and fortuitously for me, uh, it's got its title and it's signed on the back uh, uh, along with the year he painted it. Now the title is A Border Girl, so she's obviously a Scots girl, Scottish yes. girl, and uh, it was painted in 1858. Now. Gilbert was unusual amongst Scottish artists in that he went to Rome. He spent a lot of time in Italy. The interest for us that that holds is that this very Scottish subject, to me, has an Italianate influence. Okay, she's a Scottish girl, but I think that there's something very Italianate about her, not only the, her, her features, but also this, 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 um, this deep red of the cloak yes. that she's wearing. Yeah. But above all, it's the way he's painted those eyes. Okay, yes, the eyes quite, are lovely. Aren't mm -hmm. they? Mm -hmm. Quite haunting. Mm -hmm. And his ability with textures is very apparent. Like the, the bonnet she's wearing, he's caught it wonderfully, the light on the side of the, the bonnet there. Mm -hmm. And the glow in her cheeks, which match with her lips the color of the cloak that she's mm -hmm. wearing. The whole thing's most alluring. It's a lovely thing. Um, did you pay a lot for it? A hundred pounds. But what? it was in early 70s. Early 70s. Um, the fact that it's in such good condition and the fact that it has such allure and power mean that I really have to value it at between eight and £12,000. Absolutely wonderful. Thank you very much indeed. There's a range of material here relating to the battleship HMS Repulse. Now, what's the family connection? My father served on the Repulse. Right, so that's your father? Yes, that's in, my father. In Repulse uniform, as that's you might correct, say. That's correct, yes. Now, the story of the Repulse, of course, is one of the great disasters of the British Navy. And on the 11th of December, 1941, the Repulse and the Prince of Wales were sunk um, by Japanese aircraft. Total disaster, the ship sank very quickly, and of course the loss of life was terrific. So, how is this photograph still here? Mm. How do we have all this material? That's a telegram. That's a telegram. Now, can I just read it? Yeah. Deeply regret to inform you that your husband, Joseph Marlon Meller, who is believed to have been serving on HMS Repulse, has not been reported as a survivor and must therefore be regarded as missing. So this is 18th yeah. of December. That's so this, is, this came to your mother, is that right? That came to my mother. All the family and friends were at the house. Everybody seemed to be making a fuss of me, and I couldn't understand it. Then, a few days later, we had a further telegram. This is the 27th of December, so 10 days, of, yes. 10 days later, in effect. 10 days later. Please to inform you, information received, that your husband is safe and now recovering at Colombo. That is correct, yes. And it appears that... Then a telegram had come from my father. From him? Yes. So, safe, treasure, fit, love. Sure, that's so, right. So what a wonderful new year it must have been. Yes, the 31st of December received that, so uh, that was a very good present for the new year. So what actually happened? How did he well, escape? It appears that, uh, very fortunately for my father, the ship called in at Colombo, and he was uh, sent on a radar course and left the ship, but his name had not been taken off the ship's register. So officially he was still on the ship? He was, Hence yes. that first telegram. And so he brought back the hat bands. Yes. And this is an extraordinary thing, the crossing the line ceremony. Of course, Sorry. everybody who crossed the, the, the line, the equator for the first time, on both yes. passenger ships and naval ships, had to go through this extraordinary ceremony where everybody dressed up, and I think they were ducked yes. in the water, and after the event, they were given the booklet, which listed their names, and of course, the certificate, which proved that they'd crossed the line on Her, Maj Her Britannic Majesty's battle cruiser, Repulse. That's correct, yes. Very That's rare survival, right. I'm sure. Well, it is, yes. So, now, when did he yeah. finally come back? Well, the night I met him, I was uh, born in 1938, so uh, I was nearly six years old, and... Uh, the bell rang, we went to the door, and uh, there was a figure. Mother said, this is your father. So <laughs> I was quite shocked, really, because uh, up to then, I, I had not had a father. So uh, I'm very pleased to see him, actually. Do you remember what you said? No, I, I can't. No, I can't remember. But uh, I think it was a really joyous moment yes. for everybody. I think it's a wonderful story and it must be terribly unusual to find things relating to the repulse. So few survivors, yes. so few people associated yes. with the ship still alive today. Yes. I mean, 
we're not talking about value because of course you know yeah. the value to this is is incalculable in terms of personal history but also the history of those times i think this is a remarkable archive i'm so glad you brought it in well, I understand it's an ear trumpet, Will, and uh, I think that my great-grandfather used to use it. Yes? You, yes. Well, you've actually got it in one. Yes. Because it should have a little um, ivory earpiece here. Oh, it's it. something does it, missing, does it work? Hasn't it? Does it work? Yes, yes. It I, yeah, it does yes, sort of. Yes, yes. yes. It's uh, very, very decorative, isn't it? It's all beautifully engraved yes, with flowers. Yes, yes. And it's beautifully done underneath as well. Look at that. Yes. Beautifully finished. This would probably sell for somewhere between 700 and possibly even a thousand pounds to a collector. This yellowing parchment is a document which is in fact a camera script and a cast list of an antiques roadshow which took place in Buxton in the pavilion in July 1978, the very first series. And among the cast list are Bruce Parker, the presenter of the time, Arthur Negus, of course, and among the others, David Batty and Simon Ball. Gentlemen, the evidence. <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> this ought to be on the memorabilia table. Somebody ought to put a value on this. 23 series later, and nothing has changed. Oh, yes, it has. <laughs> I've, got, I've got less hair. <laughs> I think at that time I have a nasty feeling that I probably had sort of sideburns like this, certainly had more hair and shirts that came out that and probably a kipper tie. <laughs> yes, yes, the dress has changed a lot. Worth a fortune now. <laughs> yes, I, I pay people not to show those old pictures. <laughs> sash window supports. Have you got sash windows at home? No, not anymore. <laughs> you can't try it up. There are, few, there are a few around here. Yeah. When the sash cords go, it's the devil of a job replacing them. Yeah. So how do you keep the windows open? Yeah. Well, you put these in as, as wedges, and yeah. the, the, the roughened area there is, is to keep a grip on the lower part of the sill. These are portraits of a particular person. And do you have any, any idea who that, no that idea. might be? I mean, there's a ram or something on there, isn't there? Ah, there's the clue. This is not a ram, this is a goat. Oh. <laughs> and what do we call goats? Nanny. Goat. Or? Billy. Billy goat. Billy. <laughs> now, think of Billy. Think of the House of Orange, because this is an orange yes, tree. Yes. William. Of Orange. Of Orange. Oh, and the Orange Order was actually um, revived um, at about the time these were made. These were made in Staffordshire sometime in the 1830s or 40s, maybe. Mm -hmm. And of course, they are very orange, aren't they? Yes. Overall. Yeah. So find a friend with sash windows of the Ulster the persuasion and you will have the perfect client. <laughs> um, political commemoratives are highly sought after and, and, and going from purely ornamental supports worth maybe a couple of hundred pounds. Mm. I mean I know they're damaged but that's yeah. not, not, yeah. not a huge problem. Yeah. These suddenly become worth rather more yes. and I'm going to say they're going to be worth to a political commemorative collector mm. somewhere in the region of eight to twelve hundred pounds. <laughs> Albums like this, and they always look like this, they have these similar sort of covers, are Chinese and they're always been known as rice paper paintings. But in fact that's a bit of a misnomer. In fact they're made from the pith of a tree. Um, they were made by the Chinese, not for their own market, purely for, for European export market. So this one here shows uh, golden pheasants, actually. When they... and I'll turn the next one now. This one shows a most fabulous moth, doesn't it? Yeah. Uh, I mean, they're fantastic condition, actually. Yes. How come they're in such good... You, have they, you've inherited these, or what? We have, yes. Um, yes. My mm -hmm. father-in-law's. Father's. Yeah. father's. Did, 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 did he go to China no and buy idea them where, there? No idea where they yeah. came from. Somebody in the family must have been well, there. Well, as far as I know, they came from his father. But really? But how they arrived there, we just don't we know. We just don't know. Um, they're made in about 1850, by the way, 1850 oh, right. and the 60s. Yes, I was going to ask. And you usually, know. what happened was that they were made in sets, so you would have a set of junks, a set of yeah. insects, all in different separate albums, set right. of courtiers, set of this, yeah. and so forth. But what to me is really fascinating about this lot is that it's a sample of each of different of the different categories. Yes. I mean, when you were, did you did you know these as children, or were you never allowed to? 
played him, I suppose, you otherwise they well, would have got no, damage. Well, we didn't actually play with them, but they, they, they were always there. We, we yeah. sort of looked occasionally, but... Uh, in the cupboard, weren't they? Yeah, when I, made I mean, this is a marvellous thing. This is a, this is a, a botanical subject matter yeah. and shows lotus, isn't it? And here's yes. the dried pod mm -hmm. and nuts, too. Now, this has intrigued me. Uh, were you ever shown this as a child, I wonder? That was always one that we always wanted to see. It is a horrible thing, it is. isn't it? It is really horrendous. I bet you didn't. No. Well, the thing is that they made albums of torture. Right. Now, God knows who bought these things, but somebody who had a, who had a gruesome frame of mind bought these things. Um, it's all clear, aren't they? They are. Yeah. And this one, I That's suppose, lovely. is the most decorative of the lot, yeah, I bet the colours which shows a basket beautiful. of flowers. Very rich, isn't oh, it? It's, it's a marvellous thing. That's my favourite one. Well, I'm glad you said that, because actually this is the most, most saleable one. I mean, effectively, it's a terrible thing to say, but if they were put up at auction, I dare say they would be broken up. It would be a dreadful thing, but that's the fact of life. Yes. But the whole lot, if you add it all up, and you've got something like, I think we're about 20 all in all. 18, 18, 18 yes. are there? Okay. Well, uh, they're going to be worth something like sort of 2,000 to 2,500 pounds. <laughs> really? It's a really interesting lot, and it's mm. fascinating. I got my bear on my second birthday. I also had a baby sister on my second birthday. That was clever of your parents. And very clever, very clever. It, she was the best thing that ever happened to me. I think it's second. I wouldn't like to have been an only child. Oh, good. So and, you were happy uh, to have a very sister. Very happy to have her. They don't all sparkle, don't they, when they you see that? Do, Look yeah. at that. Yeah. Anyway, anyway, I'm sorry. <laughs> but t tell me a bit more about the background of them. Well, these rings belong to my mother. And when she died, they came to me. Did she tell you where they come from at all? No, Any family I background don't or anything? Know. I, I don't know the history of them at all, no. I don't know. Because in many ways, they're all different periods. This is a, a very typical band ring, probably made in about the 1970s. Look at the diamonds, because I don't know if you can see that they have rather grey, dull, blobby-looking centres to them. The reason is, is that they are a much more simple cut. They're called single cut diamonds. Mm. And they lack the luster of the far more complicated, brilliant cut diamonds. Mm. Now, this is a brilliant cut diamond, and I think you can see the intense sparkle of that stone in comparison yeah. with these stones. So, there's another feature. When you get a diamond that's a single cut, the value of it is considerably lower than it is uh, for the full brilliant cut. Mm. So. This 1970s gold band ring with straightforward single cut stones, if I was selling this in auction, I might expect to get, I don't know, maybe around about 300 pounds for it. This one um, is a brilliant cut diamond that weighs around about 1.8 carats. It's a nice, bright, brilliant cut stone in a very pretty, fussy and quite complicated setting of platinum and gold. But the problem is with this stone, when I look at it through my lens, I can see that it's severely hampered by having a very nasty floor at the side. And with these stones, they're valued according to how few the floors are and how white the stone is. So if a diamond is white and completely clean, it's far more valuable than a stone that's a bit off colour and a bit flawed. This one is quite severely flawed. So it's probably worth in auction around about maybe fourteen hundred pounds, fifteen hundred pounds. Really? Yeah. Good heaven. And I would insure it for maybe around you know, three thousand pounds possibly as a retail price. Now this bear, as you probably know, is actually made in Germany. Oh I know that, yes. yes. You do? Yes. And you know he's made by the firm of Steiff? Yes. May I hope yes, do. He shakes his head, but he won't growl anymore. Won't growl. I can, I can hear there's a growler in oh, there. there's a growler in there, yes. Um, yes. But you oh, probably yes. tipped him up too many times. Probably that <laughs> was, yes. yes. Um, he's known as a cinnamon colour, and as such, is one of the most collectible colours yes. of all the bears. Yes, I always, always knew he was different. I would have said he probably dates to about 1908. Yes, well, it's 1909 here. Oh, 1909. 1909, yes. Yeah. Well, it's very rare for me to meet the owner of oh. a 1909 bear. I feel very privileged. It's, it, 
it's very unusual for them to be photographed, let alone on television. You know, if you were try going to try and buy a bear like mm -hmm. this, mm -hmm. by Steiff, um, a cinnamon bear, it would be very hard to find one under yes. 4,000 pounds. My goodness, <laughs> it's, you're worth keeping it on that, aren't you? Now let's move on to this one. The feature that is most outstanding about this diamond is that it's bright yellow. It is, yes. And um, that means that it's a totally different ball game from these white diamonds because this then is a fancy yellow diamond. Mm -hmm. And when you talk about fancy colored diamonds, the value of them totally transcends the valuation for a white diamond. She always referred to it as canary. Well, I think it's a good word to yeah. use, although these days they use a scientific approach to establish exactly how much of the, of, of the depth of color yellow it has. And there are different grades of yellow. There's a fancy light yellow, a fancy yellow, the very best grade of yellow is fancy vivid yellow. And goodness me, that is a very, very intense color. Now, we have a setting, which is platinum. Mm -hmm. And this very, very fine piercing work in the mount would tell me that the ring was probably made in around about 1925. But I think that the diamond was probably cut in about 1910 or 1920. Now, that's very good news because it would suggest if it's that age, the chances of it being treated to make it yellow are not very likely. Mm. So there is a procedure we have to follow to establish exactly what grade of yellow the stone has. Now, if we calculate the weight, it weighs around about 3.2 carats. We then send it off to a laboratory, typically in the States, mm. where they will issue a certificate to confirm A, that it's natural color, be that if it is natural color what intensity of yellow the stone has now in these lights it's rather difficult to see but i think this is a pretty good looking yellow subject to all these caveats um i think that probably it's worth something in the region of maybe ten thousand pounds gosh yes oh and she used to wear it when she's doing the housework and gardening and <laughs> She well, just had them on all the time. I didn't noticed she? that this oh. one is clogged up with quite a lot of dirt <laughs> at the back. <clears throat> and you've already cleaned it. I yeah. took it just to clean that one out and have a look at it carefully. But honestly, it's something that needs to go through this procedure, yeah. but it, it, it really is quite an exciting gem. Yeah. Certainly not the sort of thing one sees every day, and you know, I'm delighted that you brought it in. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. <laughs> And that's it for the first show of the new series, but I would like to tell you about a special event. It's our annual Children's Road Show, which we should be recording from Milestones, Basingstoke in Hampshire, on Sunday the 14th of October. It's open to young people up to the age of 18. Uh, adults will be allowed in, but only if they're looked after by a responsible child. So if you're under 18 and you'd like to know more about your precious collection, or indeed your family heirlooms, you should write now to this address for your free ticket. Antiques Roadshow, The Next Generation, BBC, P.O. Box 229, Bristol, BS 99, 7JN. Or you could apply online via our website, which is www.bbc.co.uk stroke antiques. Until next week, from Derbyshire, goodbye. And Michael's back at the same time next Sunday. Tomorrow morning on BBC One, Bargain Hunt goes on the trail of antiques in the return of a news 11.30.